Welcome, everybody. Uh, so we've been doing this series called The Radical Middle, and it's just about staying centered on the things of God and uh, avoiding the things that polarize the extremes. Uh, it polarizes people, even Christians, uh, when, whenever we embrace a, a, a worldview that is opposed to the kingdom. And I've been using the word kingdom view to represent what the Bible teaches. Uh, worldview, as I've been using it, is kind of uh, about the world. Um, it's a view of the world. But kingdom view has in its sights uh, the broader reality. You know, because there's a lot of things that exist that aren't physical, um, that aren't uh, immediately tangible like that. In fact, those things are the most important things. They're a lot more important than, than the things that the majority of people spend the majority of their time and energy on. So today, what I want to talk about is the priority of the kingdom view. Let's pray over this topic. Lord, as we examine just a very simple and common passage of Scripture, Lord, I pray that you would give us new insight, uh, and I know the only way that comes is through the power of your Holy Spirit, so Holy Spirit, we invite you to come, illuminate our minds, open our hearts, give us ears to hear, in the name of Jesus, amen. So here's the topic, or I'm sorry, the scripture that we're looking at today, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Super familiar passage, I know, but I think as we dig into this, um, it's going to be really good for us to spend some time thinking through this. Uh, this passage is all about what our title is. It's all about the priority of the kingdom view. Uh, that's why it says, seek first the kingdom. It's about priority. Uh, and basically what this is saying is make God's kingdom and God's righteousness your first priority. So let's start out by examining those two words, the kingdom of God, the kingdom, and righteousness. What exactly is the kingdom of God? It's actually pretty simple, uh, but people do get confused about it because, you know, when, when somebody talks about a kingdom, we have in mind a worldly kingdom, right? Uh, and there are similarities between the kingdom of God and earthly kingdoms. Uh, you know, they both have a king, <clears throat> but in other ways, they're infinitely different. See, the kingdom of God doesn't have physical boundaries like an earthly kingdom does. It doesn't have a physical seat of power like an earthly kingdom does. So the kingdom is present when what God wants to happen, happens. It really is that simple. It, it can get more complex than that. But when you think about the kingdom, don't think about a geographic location. Think about where God's will is done. Think about the range of God's effective will. That's what the kingdom of God is. Now, you could say that God's kingdom is his priorities. I mean, that's one way of looking at it. It's about what's important to God. So seeking first the kingdom is seeking God's will, God's priorities as our will and our priorities. When we do that, that's the kingdom of God coming. That's why Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this, your kingdom come your will be done. That's how it comes. See, earthly kingdoms don't come. They're just there. Well, well, we bring God's kingdom when we live his kingdom. And that's kind of what we're talking about. And then a kingdom view is simply viewing all of reality through the lens of the kingdom like I just described it. It's thinking about things the way God thinks about them. It's believing what God says about things. That's the kingdom. So it says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. 
Now this word, I touched on it a little bit last week. Uh, this is the Greek word, the kaiasune. And um, every one of us, every believer should have a very deep and working understanding of what this word means. It appears in the New Testament 92 times. So that frequency alone should alert us to the fact that this is an important concept. This is an important word. Now, unfortunately, that frequency can also be the very thing that causes us to overlook it. I had a, a vivid reminder of that this week. Um, I received a letter, you know, a long time ago, and I just set it on my desk. Did you ever do this? I set it on my desk. It's been there for so long that I don't even see it anymore. <laughs> you know, it's just there. Um, but this week I was going through things, and I, I picked this up, and I read it, and I realized, oh, if, uh, this, it was from someone who publishes some of my music, and there's actually money waiting for me. <laughs> All I have to do is do what they're, sign up for this thing that they're telling me to do on this letter. So that's, that's a picture of what can happen when we see things too much and don't pay attention to them. The word righteousness is something we talk about all the time, isn't it? It's something you read about in the Bible all the time. So it, that familiarity can cause us to not, this is really good that we're pausing and thinking about what exactly does righteousness mean? If that's what we're supposed to seek, what does it mean? Well, you know what? There are two errors that Christians fall into when they think about righteousness. Uh, the first one is something that the modern church has fallen into. See, we think that uh, all we have to do is pray the sinner's prayer, and then we're a Christian, and that's it. We're done. If we're doing evangelism, all we got to do is get someone to pray the sinner's prayer, and, and, and that's it, right? But you know, the problem with that is, is we've made it all about salvation rather than what Jesus said, rather than what Jesus told us to do. <clears throat> he said, go and make disciples, right? Not go and make converts, not, not, go and make, not go and get people saved, as we say, which, by the way, that's not a biblical terminology. It's not that people don't get saved. It's that that's, I think it's a wrong way of thinking. I won't get too far into that. But somehow, modern Western Christians think, you know, the finished work of the cross, when Jesus said it is finished, they think that means that, that we're finished. But you know what? That view leaves no room for the active process of discipleship, something that Jesus, right before he ascended, made a top priority for us. Make disciples. So that's the first error. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls that cheap grace. The second error is legalism. And that just means, you know, that you think you can follow some set of rules and you'll be righteous. Now, both of these errors, cheap grace, legalism, they're both dangerous and they're both foreign to the teaching of the New Testament. So this verse that we're looking at today is part of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's a sermon, it's a message that Jesus gave to a crowd of people, and it's probably the most significant thing in the whole Bible, the Sermon on the Mount. It's in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, chapters 5, 6, and 7. Uh, and it's so important for us to understand that the Sermon on the Mount is not just this random collection of, of sayings, like like I said, this is part of it, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. We've heard this a thousand times, but this is not a standalone saying that we can just pull out and apply without detriment. This is part of a broader message that Jesus was preaching. 
<clears throat> and we have to view it that way. Some people think that it's just a bunch of scattered things that were thrown together. It is definitely not. It is very cohesive. And what it's about, it's a comprehensive message about living life in the kingdom. That's what it's about. It's about righteousness and what real righteousness is like. It's about how the kingdom is now available to us. That kingdom that we talk, it's available. We can live in it. We can live in its power here. That's what it means, kingdom of the heavens. The heavens, there's three heavens. The heavens is just space. It's just this. That's what he's talking about. It's available to us here and now. <clears throat> so, with all of that in mind, um, this, this is part of the sermon. In chapter 5, earlier in that same service or sermon, Jesus said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the righteousness, that's what we're talking about, right? Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you catch that? Does it get your attention? Does it make you go, hmm, Jesus said that. I, I really ought to pay attention to it. So he mentions the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They were the people who thought you could just follow the letter of the law and you would be righteous before God. Well, right after Jesus made that comment, he gave uh, six scenarios, six examples. He did this all the time to help you get your head around it. He gave us six scenarios uh, that create a contrast between the legalistic error and the ways of the kingdom. Now notice he didn't even mention the cheap grace error. You know why? Because, and he does, he doesn't overtly mention it, but all through this, um, what's happening here is uh, it's just assumed that if you are living the kingdom view, that your actions will follow. It's just assumed. It's like, I have water on my arm, so my, water, my, my arm is wet. It's just a given. If you're in the kingdom view, your actions will reflect it. So you probably remember these six examples that he gave. Um, the first one was, uh, oh, he started each of them, by the way. He started with the words, uh, you have heard that it was said. What is he talking about there? He's actually talking about the old covenant. You have heard from the old covenant that it is said. And then, he, and then every time he says, but I say. He's establishing the new covenant here. So the first one says, you have heard that it was said, old covenant, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. So that's one of the 10 commandments, right? It's the law of Moses. But he didn't, he didn't abolish that. You know, it's still a really good idea to not murder people. But what he did was he expanded on it. He said, but I tell you, new covenant, that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Then he did the same thing for all five of the other areas that he talked about. Adultery, divorce, oaths, revenge, and love. What's he doing here? He is redefining what it means to be righteous. He's redefining righteousness. And it seems like his version is way harder than Moses's version. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh man, now I can't even look at a woman lustfully. But it's so important for us to understand he's not modifying the law. He's not creating more laws or new laws. That's not what he's doing. He's just pointing out that if you try to follow the letter of the law, your sinful heart will find loopholes and you will still do evil. That's the message here. And he actually 
uh, he, this is about the kingdom. He's basically saying, if you have a kingdom heart, that's true righteousness. The pure in heart will see God. And the kingdom works its way out into our actions. He gave a really cool illustration of that later in Matthew. Uh, he said, you know, you religious people, he said, you wash the outside of the cup and you leave the inside dirty. Why wouldn't you wash? Think about this. Think about dishes. Which part's a lot dirtier, the inside or the outside? The inside, of course. If you spend time really cleaning the inside of the dish, the outside is automatically clear, clean, isn't it? So what does that mean? It means if, if your heart is aligned with the kingdom, if your heart is aligned with the kingdom, your actions will automatically follow. That's the message. And I like that word alignment. I use that word alignment on purpose because that really fits, the modern vernacular of alignment really fits the word the kayasune, being right before God. It's when our character, our thoughts, our intentions, what we love, what we value, what we want, it's when those things are in right alignment with God. It's when we are as we should be in our hearts before God. That's what righteousness is. That's what the kayasune means. So we're supposed to make that our first priority. The kingdom of God is rule and reign, God having his will and way with us, and righteousness, the kayasune as we just defined, defined it. Uh, so it says... Make the kingdom first. Then he says, if we do that, all these things will be added to us. These things. What are these things? Well, if we want to understand that, we have to see this in context. Remember, context is king. This is, this is all about the, what Jesus is communicating. So this is a part of the Sermon on the Mount uh, towards the end of this section where he's talking about do not worry. He's talking about worry. That's the context of this. Let's look at that. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So what are these things? Well, for the people that Jesus was talking to, they were very poor. So it was about food and water and clothes. He's saying, don't worry about those things. But then right the verse following this section, it says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So what's that about? It's about the uncertainty of the future. Now, in America today, uh, even the poorest people typically don't have to worry about food and clothes. I know that's not always true, but that it's not a common concern anymore, right? But worrying about tomorrow, all of us can relate to that, can't we? Especially this year. <laughs> and isn't that the nature of worry? It's about the future. It's not about, we don't worry about what's already happened. We worry about what could happen. So even if we're worrying about the past, we're worrying about what could happen as a result of the past. Worry is about the future. But what Jesus is communicating here is, so what are you worried about? What do you need? Jesus is saying, don't make that your first priority. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and I'll take care of all those other things. <laughs> Seems like people today do just the opposite though, right? We seek everything else first and we almost ignore kingdom priorities. 
Susan and I pray together almost every morning, unless there's some big extenuating circumstances. We pray together every morning. Uh, one day this week when we were in prayer, uh, I was hit with an almost overwhelming sense of how important that prayer time has been for me and, and for my life and the way it's affected my life. And one of the biggest reasons it's been that important is because every morning I sort through everything that's going on and I put God first. I actually have to consciously and with some effort do that. Go, okay, God, that's yours, that's yours, that's yours, that's yours. Okay, you come first. There's lots of things we have to deal with and think about and you know, respond to. But where's God on that list of priority? Because life is so full of distractions. It's so full of busyness. Most people hit the ground running in the morning and they don't stop until their head hits the pillow at night. You know, maybe, maybe you watch some TV at night to unwind. That's what we do. But then, you know, then I end up upset about everything that's wrong with the world, you know? How do we prioritize the kingdom? How do we prioritize God's rightness? You know, according to a study that I read this week, this might surprise you, 55% of Americans, not Christians, 55% of Americans pray every day. I was impressed by that until... I read the study that said how much time they spend doing that. <laughs> the average person spends nine minutes a day on all spiritual activity on average. So that, that includes prayer, Bible study, and whatever else you categorize as um, spiritual activity. Nine minutes a day. I know some people spend a lot more than that. Some people don't spend any, but it might surprise you also to know that on average, Americans watch five hours of TV every day. I don't even know, how are, how are we doing that? If we're so busy, you know, we're driven by the tyranny of the urgent. So how do we spend so much time watching TV and so little time on our spiritual well-being? You know, the answer to that is actually pretty simple. It's because TV is an escape. So are video games, social media, and all the other mostly unimportant stuff that we spend all our time on. But you know, we're tired. We come home, we don't, you know, we don't want to work, we don't want to think, so we let the TV think for us. I get it. You know, the TV gives us a break from reality. It takes us on adventures. And, and you know what? People really do need an escape from the hardships of life. But five hours compared to nine minutes I mean, I don't say that to shame anyone in any way or anything like that, but I'm going, is that really what's best for us? Not only that, consider this. Seriously, consider this. Who is it that's thinking for us when we spend all that time watching TV or movies or whatever? Who's doing the thinking? What scenarios are they painting for us? See, I can tell you for sure, in general, Hollywood does not share our kingdom values and priorities. They don't. That's just a fact. It's all about sex. It's all about all these other values that don't even appear in Scripture. Now, I'm not saying don't watch TV. But what I am saying is, first of all, we need to be very careful not to let anyone 
think for us other than, or influence significantly our thinking other than God and the things of God. Then also, maybe some of us need to shift the balance of what we're spending our time on, right? Listen, Jesus always found time to pull away from the crowds. Even his close friends, he would pull away and he would go get alone with the Father and be recentered, realigned. We can only give out what we take in. What are we taking in? Listen, if Jesus needed to do that, <laughs> how much more do we need to do it? But I can tell you for sure, if you don't prioritize that, it's not going to happen. Not only that, if you don't believe that that is valuable, if you don't really desire it, if you don't go, ooh, that's something I really want, I'll tell you right now, it's not going to happen. You have to want it. So how do we want it? And how do you fit that into your life when, you know, people are so busy already? Well, I've seen this analogy used. I'm, I'm kind of adapting it to what I'm talking about today. If you've seen it before, just stick with me because I'm putting my own spin on this. This is a really big glass jar, and it represents your life, my life, our lives. And what this jar is capable of holding represents our capacity, you know, the amount of stuff we can deal with, okay? These are some big round rocks that represent the most important things in life. So these are God's priorities for us. God's priority for us is our family. It's the calling that he, something, whatever he's called us to. But most importantly by far is our inner life with him. You following me? The most important rock is our inner life with God. It's our dekaya sune. It's our rightness. It's our alignment with God. Okay? Now, this is the jar filled to the top with, the, with those important things, the rocks. And it's a picture of our life being filled with the right things the things that ought to fill our life. Now, I think I know, I know a lot of people look at this analogy and they go, yeah, mm -hmm. that's why I hesitate to, God, to give God the right place in my life because when I do, there's not any room for anything else. There won't be, will there? There won't be any room for anything else if I fill my jar with all those big things. But actually, this is a pile of small pebbles, pea gravel or whatever, and they represent the less important things in life. So this could be our job, our hobbies, our house, our car, you know, whatever. Um, they're important things, but they're less important than the things that are already in the jar. Now, even though the jar seems full right now with the big priorities, we can actually pour these pebbles into this jar because what will happen is they just fill the spaces between the big rocks. There's room for them. But now it's really full, right? What about all the other stuff of life? Well, this is a pile of sand, and it represents everything else, all the small stuff of life, everything that life throws at you. Even though the jar seems full, we can pour the sand into this jar. It will fit because, again, it just goes into all the little spaces between the big rocks and the little rocks and the glass. It'll fit. You see where this is going? Now, what would happen if we would have filled that jar to the top with sand first? You would never be able to fit the big rocks in there. And that's what's happening. With many people, that's what's taking place. We just let the small things of life fill our jar and then there's no room for the big stuff. 
What a great picture of what I'm talking about today. The priority of the kingdom view. Listen, if you see things the way that God does, if you view the things through the kingdom, if you have the kingdom view, you will not give God your leftovers of your time. You're not going to come to the end of your day, you're exhausted, and you go, oh, man, I forgot to talk to God. God, I just... You're not going to give him the leftover the leftovers of your resources. You'll give him the first fruits. Because those will be the first things in the jar. Those will be your priority. And then everything else just has to fit in around it. And miraculously, it does. Seek first. Top priority, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Put those in your jar first and all the other little things and medium-sized things will be added to you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for that word picture and I ask God that you would help us to prioritize the biggest things. And Lord, we understand that the big things don't always look like the big things because physical reality seems like the most important thing. But you say it's not. It's not your kingdom, your righteousness. Those are the top priorities. So God, if we don't understand that, if we can't get our head around it, we won't live it. So God, by the power of your spirit, help us understand this. Help us believe it. Help us desire it, God. And Lord, as you do help us, help us to respond. It it does take a, a reaction from us. We have to say yes. So this morning, if this message challenges you, if it speaks to you, Let's just take a moment and say yes. Let's take a moment and pray and just respond to God in this. So if that's you, just agree with this prayer that I'm praying. Lord, help me to believe in your priorities. Help me to live your priorities, God. And I say yes to you, Lord. I say yes, whether it's for the first time or the thousandth time, I say yes to you. And God, I, Greg Russell, I say yes to you. Realign me in any areas that I'm not living the kingdom view. In Jesus' name, everybody who agreed with that said amen.